the, the red line. Uh, I see that uh, in an in a interview for the Deutsche Welle, you, you said that, uh, quote, I have always promoted the formula firmness without closure, which means that we must be really firm on fundamental uh, principles. Could you please uh, a bit uh, elaborate what would be for you red lines, what which these countries should not go over? We um, are very clear on that. Uh, as you probably know, the, our um, integrated strategy for the Sahel is uh, based on a political um, inspiring uh, principle, which is governance. I think it's the most important in the sense that we, th- we really believe that uh, if, if, if it were possible to have uh, good governance in the Sahel, many of the um, challenges that the countries are facing now would uh, uh, be tackled or uh, uh, at least uh, changed into opportunities. Of course it is not easy and uh, this is why we contribute with all our means to uh, electoral processes and uh, other uh, activities that are um, going in this direction in trying to re-establish uh, uh, constitutional order and uh, governance. Red lines for us uh, are uh, you know, respect of human rights and uh, of course uh, uh, he- uh, helping the population of course, we want constitutional order, considering that in the, in the region we have two countries where there have been uh, coup d'etat, and uh, one country which is in transition after, let's say, a succession of the president who died and was uh, was uh, substituted by his son. So these transitions uh, for us are very serious, and we would really like the transitions, especially the roadmap and uh, you know the, the chronogram of the transition to be respected. This is another red line in the sense that we want to see uh, elections and the return to constitutional order happen to make sure that governance is possible. Um, you mentioned red, red lines. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, the keyword governance, um, electoral process, constitutional. Um, order. Now, one might look at the map and say that these countries are not uh, picture builds of democracies, uh, which are currently, uh, which are in in in, uh, in the Sahel. I also looked up the number that um, the European Union, for example, alone to Mali, uh, has provided 472 million euros in, in humanitarian aid since 2012, where the, uh, where the security situa- uh, situation worsened. We have seen in, in other European Union uh, partner countries, including Ethiopia with the Tigray crisis, that the European Union has measures that they can implement uh, if they partners cross the so-called red lines, but you just uh, defined. Currently, the European Union has implemented, for example, in Mali, travel restrictions and asset freezes. What would be the next step in order that if there's more crossing of the red line, what would be the next step that the European Union would do? Slash other way asked, what should the Malian government do that this don't happen? We are not alone in the Sahel because, uh, as you very well know, there are big organizations that are uh, devoted to the political uh, processes in the region. For instance, ECOWAS, which is the uh, economic um, community of uh, the countries of of Western Africa. ECOWAS for us is a very important organization. The European Union, since the beginning of the crisis in Mali, um, really decided to, to, uh, let's say, try to uh, uh, accompany the the, the decisions of uh, ECOWAS, um, considering that we, uh, according to the principle of uh, ownership, would like the countries of of Western Africa to take the decisions by themselves. So when the crisis started, we waited for ECOWAS to take decisions and we um, somehow supported the, the, the decisions. So when I say we are not alone, there are many things ongoing in the region. Uh, and this is very important because this means that there is a lot of uh, discussion, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, political engagement and uh, it is necessary because if we want to obtain some good results for the future, this is the only way. Regarding Mali, of course, uh, the red line was Wagner. Wagner was instead, unfortunately, uh, employed by the, the government of Mali um, uh, together with many other events uh, that, that have uh, taken place which have somehow um, worsened the situation and also our ability to have an open dialogue uh, which would lead to solutions of problems. At the moment, the situation is a bit stagnating. Nevertheless, we continue the dialogue. 
uh, there, are, there have been many events. Um, for instance, recently there was a big event at the Security Council in New York in which the mission of the, U the, uh, of the United Nations MINUSMA was discussed and uh, the, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Mali was present, as well as in many other occasions in which we have the opportunity to have a dialogue with Mali. Certainly, they are making choices that are difficult for us to accept. For instance, recently they voted against the resolution which was proposed on the first year and anniversary, uh, said anniversary of the war in Ukraine, and they were uh, amongst the uh, seven countries that voted against the resolution, which obviously uh, is a signal of uh, their will to position themselves outside the, the global debate. And this is uh, what I would like to tell them in the sense that uh, it is not a matter of uh, voting yes or no. It's a uh, where you want to position yourself in this moment in which the global order is redesigning uh, and therefore you know to put yourself in a club of seven together with Syria, with, uh, with uh, North Korea, uh, means that you are making a choice that is going to have an effect on your populations. And especially if we talk about democracy, I always try to correct this, uh, this kind of approach because I don't think that we can uh, transpose our model to other countries. I think that we have to talk about contextual democracy in the sense that the, the, the countries uh, can interpret this concept by themselves. But of course what we can do, because we are partners, and I repeat this, we are partners, meaning we share uh, the destiny uh, of, uh, of our generations, new generations, what we can do, we can accompany the processes and make sure that the, the, the kind of democracy they want, which uh, has to be based of course on uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other things that we all share at global level, of course we can accompany the processes and make sure that they develop the model that can allow the populations to develop and prosper and especially, for instance, just to make it clear to our listeners, to allow individuals to realize themselves. This is something that for us it's uh, obvious, you know, going to school and uh, having protection at health level and so on. In these countries, this is absolutely uh, impossible. And uh, therefore, you know, um, with our work, uh, the European Union, uh, we, we would like to be able to contribute to, to this kind of uh, uh, new asset in, uh, in, in societies in the Sahel. Thank you. For, I'd like to go uh, still, we have a couple of minutes left, um, into the section called Lessons Learned. You have been now, since you mentioned uh, 21, the uh, special representative uh, to, for the Sahel from the European Union. If you look back uh, now, the past two years, a lot, of ha a lot has happened. Russia has gained influence. Uh, Europe has uh, put also sanctions on. What would you have done differently? What would you wish that the European Union would have done differently or realized earlier? I always look at the future because I spent all my life in conflict areas. If I were not optimistic and I were, were not always looking at the future, I would have been stuck probably and not been producing ideas as I still do, luckily enough, and now. Uh, therefore, uh, what I can say, uh, lessons learned in the sense of what we can do now. What we can do now is uh, to adapt our language because now there is a fight over narrative which is very serious. No, it is not by chance that we always talk about uh, the huge effect of uh, the disinformation campaign of Russia, for instance, which is not only Russia, unfortunately, now is also other, other big actors that are using this kind of uh, uh, tool of warfare. And therefore we have to develop a proper narrative that really reunited, uh, reunites us to the population of the Sahel. We are the same population. This is the, the principle on which we should build our future. We are the same population. Uh, we will be even more uh, united in the future given the, the demographic, uh, demographic growth of uh, Africa, which will made us, uh, ma make us really a, a one, only one population, big population. And as I said, this population will be Euro-African or African-European, as, as we want to say. And this is why this is probably the lesson learned that we have to apply in the future. Speak the same language, develop this kind of understanding that is still developing now. I know that we have so many, so many things in common that we can develop it. 
But at the same time, we know that something in the past sometimes was not clear enough. We were not able to express ourselves and to make us ourselves understood. And we are still applying certain probably cultural schemes of the past that sometimes are difficult to uh, put in place in terms of diplomacy and uh, negotiations. I know that we are able to, to speak the same language and uh, I really count on the Europeans and on the Africans to develop this common language. I always say we need to develop a European African language or African European language because this is the moment to do so and we have to be be prepared for the future. This is the only way by which we can uh, contrast uh, uh, negative influences that don't, do not have any, uh, any intention of really doing good for the future, but only uh, the idea of exploiting resources and uh, dividing populations. This is the moment to, to act in this sense. What are for you the, the means how to do that? One is, of course, to have the narrative. The second would be then that people also understand it and, and, and hear it and promote it. We all speak a lot about the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, for example, which focuses on infrastructure. There is a new global security initiative uh, proposed by Beijing. Russia, like you mentioned and we talked about earlier, is using mercenaries, the Wagner Group, for, for pushing its uh, own agenda or worldview. The European Union has reacted to this on different kind of team of team Europe uh, approaches or, or the infrastructure program called Global Gateway. What should happen there so that the narrative also comes to the people uh, in the Sahel region? We are not in competition with these uh, actors. So we are the European Union. We are the main partner of each of the countries of the Sahel. This means a lot. The main partner, meaning we are the ones who give more money. The, the ones who have expressed the more political will, the ones who have been by the side of the population more, considering all the emergencies that there are with our humanitarian aid. So we are not in competition. We have to reinforce our ability to be by the side of the population, becoming part of that uh, pro cultural process that is developing in the countries of the side. It's not easy, but we are starting to do so. Also because we have so many instruments and so many people who work for the European Union and with the European Union at multilateral level and bilateral level. Don't forget that there are 27 member states that travel through the region, have embassies, uh, put in place development projects. So we are really a reference point for the countries of the Sahel. They do not deny that. In fact, they always repeat it and they are grateful. And we are also grateful to them for choosing us as main partners, because for us it's also a way of building our future, which is in need of uh, having partners from, uh, from the African continent, because as you know, the African continent is really going to plays an important role in the future. So I, I really think that this is the only way by which we can uh, build a, a proper uh, system, uh, because uh, we, we must not forget that while we do you know, very practical things, which means money and projects, at the same time we have to build a solid understanding between us. I think it is possible. Not easy, not easy, but possible. Building a solid uh, understanding between us two and leveraging that, what we have, like you mentioned, uh, the European Union is the main partner with uh, most of the financial means also for this region. It has been a pleasure to discuss with you, European Union Special Representative for the Sahel, Emanuela Dere. Thank you very much for taking the time to be today with us. Uh, we're looking forward to engaging with you in the future. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And uh, also I want to thank you for focusing on the Sahel because uh, despite it's not always on the front page of the, of the journals, in reality is uh, probably the most important uh, dossier on the table of the European Union at the moment, of course, after Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much.